Okay. Um, well, so my name is Randy McDermott, and I work with Kevin at, at NIST. And uh, I'd just like to say that I, I, I have sympathy for all of the engineers who do real work. Um, I, I used to do real work. And um, after my talk, you will have heard essentially the same discussion presented pretty much three different ways. Um, I, I'm going to give you a bit of a reprieve just to say that what I'm talking about today is sort of far off into the future kind of research stuff. And um, what I'm going to talk to, to you about today is try to introduce uh, a, new, a little bit of terminology that's very similar to a lot of the, the stuff that, that Steve and Craig were talking about, but uh, bring in this term called uh, the terminology of quality assessment. That is, that is used by the turbulent combustion community who have been looking at this issue in large eddy simulation um, for quite some time. So essentially, the, the, the question that I'm trying to answer, the problem that, that, we, that we face going forward is to ask, what, is the, what resolution do we need in order to trust the physics of our models, as, as Professor Quinteri was saying. So on the left here, I have one result. Um, this is temperature uh, broken up into grid cells. On the right, I have another result. These are, these are actually come from the exact same simulation. I've just zoomed one of them in. But as a model user and as a model developer, when we're looking at what grid resolution is necessary to accurately resolve physics. This is effectively the problem that we're faced with. All of the parameters that, that Kevin listed in his little box, his compartment fire, are not generally known to us in, a, in, in the general problem. They may be known in a design fire scenario, okay, but for fire spread and other uh, problems, they are not generally known. So this is the question that we're trying to, to answer, is, is this sufficient resolution? So a quick outline of my talk, I'll talk a little bit about this, this general problem of whether, uh, what Professor Quinteri was talking about, whether or not we have data to uh, validate the model. I'll talk about a prerequisite for um, the model um, uh, in terms of convergence, and then we'll go on to talk about um, some quality metrics uh, above and beyond this D star over DX metric that, that Kevin was talking about before, and then we'll look at an example of how, um, of how these metrics can be applied. So I want to introduce this idea of application space. I want to steal a, uh, a metaphor from uh, Nassim Taleb's The Black Swan, which is a book that every modeler ought to, ought to read. And in the introduction, he has a passage where he talks about Umberto Eco's anti-library, he calls it. So, Apparently, Umberto Eco has a li personal library of some 30,000 books. And he breaks up his visitors into two types. People who walk in and marvel at the number of books look and, and believing that he's read them all. And then the type of person who realizes that there's no way he could possibly have read them all, but that there is actually virtue in having an entire library of unread material. So to extend this into the to modeling, to the modeling world, I want you to envision the application space of a model. And we have several parameters that the model is being, is, as input to the model. And the concept here is that the black circles represent, uh, the black lines represent areas where the model has been so-called, so, has been validated, let's say. And each of these dots represents a validation experiment. And this red, line represents, for the sake of argument in this case, the theoretical applicability of the model. Now, basically what I want to point out is that these models are, what we're really interested in is this space where the model is theoretically applicable, but we don't actually have validation data. If we had the validation data, most likely we wouldn't need the model to begin with. So a prerequisite for assigning a mesh resolution that we believe in is what we call LES to DNS convergence. 
So LAS means large eddy simulation, and DNS means direct numerical simulation. And DNS, in its, in its uh, best, truest form, we hope can be thought of as a, as a substitute for experiment. We actually say that we trust the, the physics of the model. And so conceptually, I just want to say, okay, if I have a coarse resolution, here we're looking at an example of a, of a methane pool fire, and a fine resolution, I always want to be able to trust that my finer resolution is a better representation of the physics than, my, than the coarser resolution. Sometimes I review papers where people have actually run finer resolution and found worse results, and they go back and use the coarser resolution results. And here, this is a, a major problem. So we're looking for, in the validation portion of the, of the model development, we're looking to make sure, and this is, here we're looking at, a, at data for the vertical velocity of the plume measured in this region. We want to look to see where we're actually getting convergence. These are three different FDS results, um, uh, six centimeters, three centimeters, and 1.5 centimeters. It's quite highly resolved for this particular case because we're looking at some very detailed um, plume measurements. But we want to get to this point where we actually see convergence. So to this end, FDS has started to look at new metrics above and beyond the D star over DX criterion. And one metric that we have added is what's called a measure of turbulence resolution, which was introduced by Pope in a paper in 2004. And the basic idea is to say that we want to model the fraction of unresolved kinetic energy in the flow. So what we do is we define this function we call the measure of turbulence resolution as the fraction of the subgrid scale kinetic energy to the total kinetic energy. The resolved kinetic energy is just the kinetic energy that we have on our grid, and the subgrid scale kinetic energy we have to model. Here we take the model to be uh, what's called a scale similarity model. So we take the difference between the, the value that we have on the, the grid and some filtered value. And the basic concept is that if the filtered value is very close to the value that we have on the grid, so here's the, for example, the FDS value velocity, here's the filtered value velocity. If these are very close to one another, then the subgrid kinetic energy is very small, hence the metric is very small, and you can with confidence say that you have um, very, a very well resolved flow. On the other hand, if you have a very high, a highly turbulent fluctuating flow so that the velocity that you have on, represented on the grid is very erratic, then when you filter this velocity, you get a smoother function, and the difference between the blue line and the black curve here can be thought of as the subgrid scale uh, velocity fluctuation. So you, you'll notice now that this, this metric is a, just a scalar value between 0 and 1, and when the value is 0, we have perfect resolution, and when the value is 1, we effectively have no resolution. So this gives us another quanti a way to quantify um, the, the, the resolution of, of our model. The second metric that I wanted to talk to you about is a, is a, is a metric that we've developed at NIST, and it's based on a wavelet decomposition. And so first, what I want to do is describe what, what on earth a wavelet is, and, and then we'll see how it can be used to assess the, the quality of the numerical solution. So imagine for a moment that we have some function, f of x, that's a function, the one-dimensional function of space. It's a continuous one-dimensional function of space. Unfortunately, in general, we do not know what this, what this function is if it were, for example, temperature or species concentration in a simulation. So what we end up with in a CFD calculation is actually a sampling of this function. Imagine if we had two grid cells, we would be sampling this function at two, two different points, as, a, as shown here by the black dots. And the best guess that we have, really, for this function, or the simplest guess that we have for this function is that it is piecewise continuous um, and uniform within each grid cell. 
So my black line here represents my best guess for what the function value is. Now, this, there's an average of these two values, which I'm going to call A. And there is what is called, and, and then there's some delta away from the average that these two values occupy, which is called, which I'm going to call C. And in the terminology in, of, of wavelets, A is called an average coefficient, and C is called the wavelet coefficient. And we'll see why in a second. So what a wavelet analysis does is it takes two points, okay, and it, and it breaks, the, breaks the, the function up into two components, one that is a, a multiple of some step uh, top hat function shown here, and one that's a, this wavelet function, looks like a little, little wave, and C is the amplitude of this, of this wave. So what you can do now, and what, why this is useful and powerful, is that you can now look at this, this function at ever increasing resolution. So if you imagine now that instead of just two points, I had 100 points, then I could first go pairwise through each point, and I could do this, this kind of a decomposition. And I have, I ha what I have now is a, a series of averages and a series of coefficients. Notice that I had two, I, what I had before were two pieces of information. I had two pieces of data, two temperatures or, or whatever. And now, when I've done, after the wavelet decomposition, I also just have two pieces of information. I've represented that data with an average and a coefficient. Where this is powerful is that if the coefficient is so small to be negligible, then I only need the average to represent the data. And this is how image compression, signal compression is done with wavelets. So, so basically when, when C is close enough to zero that I can throw the C away, then I can, I can represent the function just with A. So now if you imagine that we were to take those 100 points and we have these series of now 50 averages, I can use those averages as a new set of data and perform the decomposition once again on these 50 points, and now I have 25 averages and 25 coefficients. You can do this all the way till you get to um, the global average, and that's what's called a wavelet transform. transform. So how do we use this to look at the quality? How do we use this to look at the quality of the, of the simulation? Very simply, let's look at a wavelet transform for two very simple situations. One where we have a straight line connecting four points, and one where we have four points that form a step function. Now, as shown earlier, if I actually have these four points, I don't know for certain what the function is. This, this func the, I'm only sampling the function on the grid, and this, this could actually look something like this, this function could look something like this, and so on. But my, guess, my best guess is that if I have four points that exactly form a line like this, that I can think of it as a straight line. Similarly, if I have four points that form a step, then I can think of this as a step. So what am I going to do with this in terms of, uh, in terms of quality? What I basically know about, these, about this situation is that my grid is over-resolved. And if you take anything away from this talk, let's realize this, that if I have four points that form a straight line, I didn't need those four points. Okay? I only needed two points. I often hear people say that, oh, well, I need, I need a lot of resolution where I have steep gradients. No, you only need two points where you have a steep gradient. You need a lot of resolution where you have step discontinuities. Here is where you need to put more points, not here. This is a normalized signal. This, this straight line could be as steep as we wanted it to be. So just doing this wavelet decomposition that I described on the previous slides, what we see, the first row of the decomposition is the average of these two points. This 0.83 is the average of these two points. At the next level of resolution, we have uh, the average of the whole signal, which is 0.5. But what's, mo what's more interesting is to look at the, coefficient, the coefficients of this, um, of this decomposition. So the wavelet coefficients for these two points is 0 .1, minus 0.17. 
minus 0.17, and the wavelet coefficient for the second level of resolution is 0.33. If you plug this into this little formula here, which is to add the two row, add the, the rows and, and subtract the second row here to get your wavelet metric, the wavelet metric is zero. So this is the same situation that we had with the turbulence metric, where when we have perfect resolution, then the metric goes to zero. When I have poor resolution in this case, then I get a wavelet metric of one half. Um, you can actually, based on this type of analysis, you, if you have zigzag patterns, which are uh, endemic of, of non-physical uh, oscill oscillations in the flow, this wavelet metric can, can go to one. So let's see how this can be applied to that, uh, to that helium plume, or I'm um, helium plume, from the methane pool fire that I was showing before. So here is a, an example of the, the turbulence resolution metric applied um, for the finest uh, resolution case, the 1.5 centimeter case. And in FDS, the way you look at this is, um, is to look at a slice of a quantity called turbulence resolution. And here this case is, uh, is, is done on, in parallel on 16 processors, so that these lines here represent the, the break in the, in the meshes. And you, add, you can also add a slice of wavelet error. And over on the right-hand side, we're looking at a, the wavelet error of the fuel mass fraction. And again, these, uh, this, in, on, over here on the left, the scale goes from 0 to 0.2. And on the right, the scale goes from 0 to 1. The reason this 0.2 number is important and the reason I chose that for this scale is because in the paper by Pope, he can sh you can show that for canonical turbulence problems, 0.2 is sort of a, uh, is a target metric value that you want to, uh, that you want to achieve um, for, for canonical uh, turbulence problems. So one way to think about this moving forward is that we would be using these metrics in order to establish what's called adaptive mesh refinement in the, in the simulation, taking the choice of the grid away from the user, okay? So that the, the, the code itself would go through and, and it would de determine where it needed higher resolution and where it could get away with coarser resolution. Notice that, and this is particularly important for, for example, the case Kevin was showing where you have these gigantic spaces with very small uh, fires where you want to have very high resolution uh, where the, the fire uh, is, as Professor Guinteri said, was, is in training um, the, the, um, the ambient gases, and then you need coarse resolution far away from the space in order to have a, a tractable simulation to get an engineering answer in a reasonable amount of time. So if we take a look at these two cases for the Sandia uh, helium plumes, and again, these are very highly resolved cases. The only reason we need to to consider um, these kinds of D star or DX values, this is 25 is extremely high, um, or 50 in, in this case, is because we're actually trying to get m very subtle fluctuations uh, in the velocity uh, profiles right near the base of the plume. We're not looking at, 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 at uh, far field uh, plume temperatures or, or anything like this. So what I'm showing here is an example uh, of the time average of the measure of turbulence resolution for this, for this case. Um, there is just, there's an, an anomaly on mesh boundaries right now that I haven't sorted out. Um, so that's why we, we see values of, of one along mesh values for the, the turbulence resolution. And, and, but what the, the important point to, to take away from this slide is that when I have my resolution, you can see that the shear layer near the base of the, of the plume becomes much better resolved. So here, the, these, uh, these values um, are very close to 0.2, whereas the values in the shear layer in the, um, in the six centimeter resolution case um, are above 0.2. And what you can find for the, the average velocity values in the base of the plume for the six centimeter case are that they are not nearly as accurate as the, uh, one, the three centimeter case and the 1.5 centimeter case. If we look at the wavelet error measure, a similar picture arrives, arises. So this is the wavelet, a time average of the wavelet error measure, again, where we, we of, of fuel mass fraction. 
And again, we see near the base of, of the plume um, where we have the shear layer between the air and, and, and the fuel, uh, where we, again, we, we need good resolution in order to get the physics of the problem right. Um, the metric itself is indicating to us that the resolution is, is poor and that if we had a code that automatically adapted the grid, this is the area where we would um, add grid adaption. Okay, so basically I just wanted to introduce this whole concept of quality assessment and it goes to discuss a lot of the ideas that, uh, that, that Steve and Craig were talking about in sort of their user effects section of the SFPE um, guide to, to model assessment. Um, there's still, actually I didn't get enough time to talk about this, but there's still quite a bit of work to do in terms of, look, in terms of the convergence of the models. This is something that, it's, it's a subtle issue that, that is on the shoulders of, of the developers, but it's, it's something that users need to, to be aware of because it, well, we, we see this all the time where, where fine scale results get, get tossed out in favor of course, course results in field models, and I think this, is, this practice needs to be um, uh, looked at carefully. Um, there's still much more work to do in terms of applying these metrics to practical problems and understanding what metrics are necessary in order to get uh, good uh, physics and, and match, um, match experimental data for, for, for practical problems. And I've also, I just note here that the turbulence metric is also high, uh, closely tied to the turbulence model, which is something I found out just in preparing the slides for this talk. Um, and I also found out that from looking at these uh, mesh quality metrics that the wavelet error measure um, points to the need for improved uh, treatment of scalar transport near mesh boundaries, which is something that we're uh, still working to develop in FDS. So sorry for this uh, little uh, preview into the, sort of the future of, uh, of, of how these, these uh, user effects may be addressed, but I'll end there and take any questions you might have. Do I have any questions for Randy? I guess everybody wants to get to break just a little bit early then. Okay. Oh, nope, Dr. Swenson. Randy, I don't have a particular question about you. Uh, this is great. But can either you or Kevin say anything about FDS 6? <laughs> I know I'm not the only person thinking that in this room. FDS 6, I think one of the best uh, threads that came up, I guess someone was asking when it's going to be released, and Kevin's comment was when it's better than FDS 553. <laughs> so we're very close, I, I would say, but I, I, keep, uh, I keep dodging questions of an exact date because if you would asked me uh, two years ago, I would have said three months, and then you asked me again, and I would have said three months, and so on. So I, I don't think I'm very credible in terms of, of saying when it's going to be I'm ready. Familiar with that I'm familiar with that it is, answer. It is painstaking and it's, you know, we don't, we don't want to have a Microsoft moment where we release it and, and everything crashes, right? So that's, I, um, that's sort of the, the sti that's the sticking point. We've, we've been asymptotically approaching uh, release for quite, quite a while. Um, <laughs> But there are, there are some sticking points. Uh, the dynamic model is, is probably 20% more expensive than the constant coefficient model. And at coarse grids, um, for very coarse grids, the dynamic model is really, it wasn't designed for coarse grids and we, can, we get erratic behavior in some, in some cases. So you know, just knowing that these models are going to be used uh, at coarse resolution you know, I, I'm very confident that the, the FDS6 is, is a good code and, and it, it does great things at these very high, at high resolution, but that's not what everybody wants to use it for, right? So, you know, this, this LES to DNS conversion is a very, convergence, which I, I, I kind of glazed over. It's, it's a very important thing. We, we have to be, the only way you can say that, that you have that, that field models are better than these correlations is that you have faith in the physics. Because the physics is the only thing that, that allows us to jump into that space where we don't have an experiment. 
Okay? And to have faith in the physics, you have to have faith that your resolution is good enough. And you can only have faith that the resolution is good enough if it gets better as you improve the resolution. So using the model to do very detailed calculations is not a worthless exercise. Um, I understand, but we also understand that engineers are not always going to be able to afford this kind of resolution. So we're working very hard to make sure that the code is convergent, but that it gives good answers in the course cases as well. And frankly, this is just something that people haven't tackled before. Okay? If you look at weather models, for example, they look at very coarse grid resolution, but they don't want to, they don't want to work at finer grid resolution. Okay? They, they'll tell you, don't, don't run this below three kilometers grid resolution, because okay? it won't work. That, we, we as fire modelers aren't, can't be in that situation. I have to know that if this, uh, you know, the outlet starts burning and I'm deciding I'm going to resolve that, it better be a, a better answer than if I just put a one meter grid around it, if I'm going to try to rely on the physics of the model. If you're going to just use a, 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 an empirical correlation or if you, if you happen to have one, that's great. But when, when we have to rely on the physics, we have to believe that the grid resolution is, is sufficient. And d star over dx is, our, is, is sufficient for these prescribed fires. But we'll, you know, one of these decades, we're going to get to actually doing fire spread, flame spread. We have all kinds of other issues to sort out um, before we can really deal with that material properties and so on. But that's why I say this is, this is research. Um, but it's, it's sort of headed that direction. Any other questions for Randy? Jim? <laughs> Jumps out to me is you, you speak to the quality of resolution and, uh, and therefore the accuracy of the results. How do you uh, address now what Steve and Greg did? What can you tell them? about this type of analysis. Do they have a good result, a fair result, a great result? Isn't that the key question? That is a key question. And that, what, what has been and still is the, the, the step of the quality assessment step is to say that we have a model that we've validated. So we, we have compared the model uh, within its applicable range, and we have um, achieved, for example, for such a case, sufficient, you know, if the question being asked is, you know, can FDS model the velocity field in the near, in the near field of a plume, then d star over dx over 5 doesn't cut it. Doesn't cut it. Okay? But d star over dx over 5 made, is, is fine if you're, which we've shown in other validation cases, if you're looking at flame height, if you're looking at upper layer temperatures, and so on. But if you, if, if you want to get the mean velocity profile you know, within a half a diameter of the, of, the, of the plume, then I would say, no, d star over dx is, is not good. And that's what our validation guide go, looks at. There's a lot of research to be done yeah. in order to take these metrics and, and then be able to apply them in cases where um, we don't have experimental data, and that's that's the ultimate goal, right? I mean, the idea, and, and that's all that's all I'm trying to say is that the ultimate goal is to be able to have confidence in the physics of your model in regions of this application space where we don't have experimental data. I mean, my understanding is FDS is used a lot in atrium calculations, like you guys showed. So it would seem to me there that the entrainment is key. So. To extrapolate from what Kevin said, show how FDS behaves over a range of Q stars for different entrainments. We, we do that. I mean, that would be that's great. in the validation guide. That's in the validation guide. That's that's current stuff. I mean, well, that's, that's, I, and it's I must been have done. missed that in there. I'll have to go I'm sorry? back. I must have missed it. I have to go back and look. Okay. And, and it's see there. The, yeah. Thank you. The Heska, they look in the Heskestead uh, section, plume section. Okay. Thanks, everybody.